one of, one of the sections that AFE Magazine has is a question, code question and answer session. And I get about 2,000 questions a year. Every question gets answered, but only a couple get published a month. And part of my message is, we have enough codes right now. We're handling all our issues right now. We don't need more. It's fashionable in Sacramento to write legislation. We got more legislation in the books you possibly can dream of. We got enough right now. So let's, let's make them better. We don't need any more. You can see that we have now air boards, air quality boards, water resource boards, fire departments have lots of regulations, health departments, county health departments, Cooper regulations, we're plethora of stuff we've got to do. Because it's fashionable now to have lots of regulation. And now we have to streamline things back to normal because we have to do business competitively, correctly, safely, and competitively. So there's my socially redeeming value. Now we're going to the code. And this is California specific. And some of the things that are happening in California is interesting because we kind of started here and it kind of spreads out. Just like, just like the hazmat stuff started right here in this Silicon Valley and now it's normal practice around the United States. Uh, special issues we have. Inventory reporting, internet availability. One of the neat things I got to in Palo Alto was to put things on the web. And I had a real aggressive guy, Dan Firth, who liked doing that. And we decided to save paperwork in Palo Alto and, and put everything on the web so that we use citizens' paperwork and not our paperwork. So you go to the web, you see a form you need, you print it out on your paper, bring it in, hand it in. It's now a state website for state forms. It also has information about classification of chemicals. Uh, if you want to classify a gas or a chemical, don't hire an expensive consultant or lots of text. You can go right there and use the site. The site also has a big advantage because in a couple of court cases I was involved with, the judge actually went to the site for classification. Uh, backflow testing, big deal. Secure, most secure job in this valley is to become a good plumber, certified backflow prevention. Because every backflow preventer has to be tested every year. Do we do that? No. <laughs> we don't do that. But the obligation is there, and God help you if you have a problem with one and you haven't tested your backflow preventers. How many backflow preventers in the building? Like, hundreds in every building. In this building, there's at least 200 in this building. This is the most important thing in the state of California, and that's ventilation. Now, for finally, ventilation by code is recognized as a mitigator for most hazardous conditions. We started that a long time ago in the valley, but overventilating for prevention of explosions for, for uh, toxic storage areas. Rather than have explosion events, we mitigate, overventilate, right? We did a lot of that time. And, and, and we found that it, it's worked. So hard that the data now shows that this is now, now a concept used for the rest of the country. How much ventilation do I need? Do I, with now with our energy concerns, do I overventilate it? That's always safe, but it costs a lot of money. But how much do I need? Well, now we, we actually go to a concept. The ACGIH publishes a book that every mechanical engineer in the valley should have. And this, this tells you how much ventilation do you need. Obviously, if I've got a pot of sulfuric acid sitting there, how much ventilation does it need? Nothing. The vapor coming off that is mostly water vapor. No sulfuric at all. Well, I need a little bit of ventilation. But, and then I have a pot of HF. Now I need extreme ventilation to make sure I capture the, all the fumes and mists and molecules that come out of there. So, again, applying knowledge and logic saves energy. Applying ACGIH gives you points in the Green Building Certification. And also it's the right thing to do. And this is not a guesswork. People have got their PhDs on figuring how much ventilation you need, how much molecules come off a pot of HF bath. So this is science, it's published, anybody can have it by a governmental agency, and every mechanical engineer in the valley should have one of these to make sure you're not overventilating an area with capturing the velocity. This is a facility in, in West Sacramento uh, a friend of mine who's a fire marshal said, Reinhardt, you got to get your butt up here, he said. He said, i got a, a building that exploded and there's no char. There's been no fire and it's destroyed. So I go up to West Sacramento, it's wintertime, and I said, yeah, Todd, what's going on? He said, look at this building. He said, there's no char. What happened here? That, that doesn't fit my 
textbook investigation procedures on explosions. So we said, oh yeah, you did. Well, I was well ventilated now. <laughs> <laughs> what, what they did in this facility was they had just had a lot of a storage battery for hydrogen. During the recharge cycle, every electrical battery generates hydrogen. As you recharge, I know cathode, you just bring things back, H2 is generated. It's a natural thing that happened. And it, this one generated enough hydrogen in a room. Well, why did it go, what did it happen in the winter? What these guys did in West Sac, it was cold, and they put polyethylene bags over the roof ventilators. So they created a condition where they didn't have enough ventilation, and they got unlucky because they hit 8.0%, because that's the exact percentage of hydrogen necessary for a perfect stoichiometric explosion. They got one. No char, no flames, just hydrogen to water vapor with a lot of energy release. So it's just like you put an air compressor in a building and blow it up. That's what it looked like. And of course, it now, like I said, well ventilated now, but it, it shows you that you have to Hydrogen is a great material. People get paranoid about it. You say hydrogen and fire guys get all freaky about it. But hydrogen has the highest diffusion constant of any molecule other than helium. And it wants to leave. You can't contain the stuff. If you have any crack in the ceiling, it's going to go. It's, gonna, it's gone with a high diffusion factor. But they decided to contain that squirrel cage and contain it. And they got an abnormal condition. And that's what caused the hydrogen explosion. A, a standby power system, you have one full minute before it engages and re gives power to what's required. Okay? In an emergency power system, 10 seconds. Okay, that's designed for health hazard type facilities. But it's not just that simple. The baggage that these power systems have to go through, the, the testing, monthly testing, the documentation, the re-engineering is onerous on emergency power and relatively minor on a standby power system. There's also continuous power, which is all generally battery backup. You see those in some emergency lights somewhere. So I can use continuous power where emergency is required? Yes, I can. You can always go better, not worse. And of course, the H5 semiconductor facilities entirely run on emergency power. Shedding power is, that's one of the most expensive things about a semiconductor fab is the power requirements and then specifically emergency power. And then all emergency equipment and at least one elevator have to be on emergency power if it's a high rise building. It has to be designated. So new buildings going up in, in the state of California, you'll see this will have a red button on the elevators, some designation saying that's the elevator to use for emergency power because elevators are now legal for egress. Never were before this code cycle. <clears throat> Quite frankly, I don't know if I would trust an elevator for emergency egress. The question is, how long do I have to have emergency power? What's the minimum duration? And the answer to that is two hours minimum. Unless you have non-ambulatory individuals involved, specifically hospitals. If, I, if I'm intending to keep people there for 36 hour duration, well then I've got to, then I have to write a report indicating how long people have to be in that condition, maintaining their life safety systems. Maintenance, and power. so I got, I got this maintenance baggage now with my emergency power system? Yes, it's something we do not do a good job of in society. We buy them, we specify them, we design them, and people do not maintain them appropriately. And that's typically NFPA 110 and 111 are documents which is two-thirds of the document is maintenance procedures. And I will tell you, if you ask to go, if you went to a fire department and say, can I see a copy of NFPA 110, they'd struggle to find it for you. Because people don't really have copies of those documents available. It requires the, the facility owner to have a, a, a schedule and written record of maintenance procedures. Switch maintenance specifically has to be documented and operational testing has to be done and documented on a frequent basis, monthly basis. Transfer switch testing has to be documented on a monthly basis. And of course, supervision by a trained individual. They need to have training in NFPA 110 and 111. So you gotta have to have some knowledge about what you're doing. Building code, California building code, unique. If you get a code that says international building code, put it on your shelf, don't use it because California has modified 40% of 
of that book is modified with California specific requirements, which are up and down, less and more stringent. When you read a code, don't assume the words mean what you think they mean. You have to check the glossary, because family doesn't mean family in a code. It means any group of individuals. Right now in the classroom, we are a family in this classroom. And also the grade, does that mean what grade or what level? Does it nouveau, the grade level? Or is it grade to go out? You have to make sure you understand what grade means. In the fire code and building code, it means exit path grade. Non-combustibility, a bad word. So non-combustible, it's non-combustibility is what they use. And it has special meaning for materials of construction in the building. And of course, unreasonable hardship is a way out of the code. No, it's a way of indicating a specific difficulty in applying provision of the code. Reasonable hardship is often used in the electrical code areas. <clears throat> New concept, control areas. This is something we're going to blow apart in California. We have blown apart, actually. Uh, it was a new concept back in 2001. Now we have control areas everywhere. It's not a big deal. Now the new buildings can have 23 control areas. Okay, what is, what is an L occupancy? California-specific occupancy. It's law in California and will be law in every state in the next, within the next six years. And that's a, a definitely an occupancy. It's one hour separation that I can plug anywhere I want in the building and perform a certain function that could be potentially hazardous. It was intended for and lobbied for by Genentech and Amgen so they could have chemistry going on on their high rise. Also chemistry for University of California. The 12th floor of UC, UC, UC in San Francisco, the 12th floor is a chemistry lab. Fully loaded with chemicals. How can they do that? That's what they use L occupancies for. It doesn't take away from your building allowable area. And smart architects are using the L to allow people to multiply their chemicals. One of the, you know the biggest user of L occupancy in the state of California right now? Stanford University. <laughs> it's not funny. It's smart. They're using the L concept and replicating labs. And they don't have to worry about chemistry of the building anymore. Because now you replicate that L occupancy. It's got a lot of planning advantages. Smart architects are using well. I can take anything I want through the corridor out here as long as I have it in an approved method of containment, cart, and I don't keep it there and store it there. So if we had an, if we had an L occupancy down the hall here, I could take anything I wanted in that L. Unless I'm an age five, and then I have things I gotta do. Semiconductor. But I could be an H4 and H2 and do it all day. Buildings throughout California and the United States are operating illegally in the biotech world. I'll show you a slide there that 95% of the occupancies above the third floor are illegal in biotech facilities. Door swing in direction of travel. Here's something to take to your facilities if you ever see them. If I got any hazardous material whatsoever in a room, Make sure the door swings of that room are out. Simple. I call that attorney fodder. That's a code change made by the University of California based on an accident that happened at UC Santa Barbara. A little laboratory a researcher got sulfuric acid on his hands. He couldn't use the doorknob or manipulate it. So the injuries escalated because he couldn't get out. So University of California put a code change that says, if you got chemicals in that, the door goes out. And by the way, I got to have padded hardware or something I can use my, my butt on. Doorknobs, doorknobs are illegal in California right now. So chapter 12 of the building code is interior ventilation, preventing the sick building syndrome. EHS people around the country are, are, are using this as a tool to encourage proper ventilation. Because you can't recirculate air that's got any chemical in it. The only exception is a semiconductor fab. And there, because of the volume of air, they're using dilution as the appropriate method of recirculation safety. In fact, one thing else in California, we have the word grandfathering does not exist in our vocabulary. 
Nowhere does a code say you can grandfather anything. It doesn't exist. You have two types of buildings. You have existing conforming and existing non-conforming. That's it. So existing non-conforming buildings have to be, have an engineering review. So you put a lot of conduit, a lot of loading on the building, make penetrations. Is it going to strengthen it? Maybe, but the structural engineers will probably review it. Anytime the code changes on seismic, you generally are in jeopardy of keeping the building out of compliance. The good news is, for Californians, is that now our code refers to AS, American Society of Civil Engineers, Standard 7. ASE 7 is less stringent than our old California laws. So we've lowered the standard of care in seismic with the new code until we find that it's not working and we'll write new laws to make it stringent. American Society of Civil Engineers has a brand new nice little book they can sell you, about 2,000 pages of what you gotta do for seismic. And that supersedes the building code? Correct. Building codes now refer to that as the guiding factor for determining seismic stability. Unsafe equipment gets a red tag. Who can call a piece of equipment unsafe? Anyone can. And those of you that have a facility or know but if somebody says something's unsafe, before you fire that person, you need to investigate and make sure that that person's words get heard. And if they're solid words, you better do it. If they're frivolous, fire them. But then you have the liability. If I, if I was a responding fire chief and I came to your facility, I am immune from prosecution. Nothing I would do, you could sue me for, no matter what I did, as long as I'm intent, my intent was proper. However, the health and welfare of my people, I was criminally responsible for. So fire chiefs are very, very reluctant to put their people at risk because they're liable for that. Not liable for your building, not liable for damage, smash your gates apart, that doesn't matter, you can't do a thing about it, but my people get hurt, I'm in trouble. So under, and I'm just telling you that so you understand where they're coming from. So safety of firefighters, emergency responders, extreme high priority. And this could happen once in a while. In fact, about 400 times a year this happens in the western states. When the humidity is below 50%, you build up enough static charge on plastic vehicles and bumpers to generate enough energy to cause a spark during fueling. And over 400 of these have happened. They've, the, all five major auto companies are working on this. The black cars are immune because now it's, there's enough carbon in them to dissipate static charges. White cars are highly susceptible. So be careful your plastic cars, generate a spark. Can I take a chemical cart in an elevator? Yes, I can now. Used to be illegal. So it's gotten a little less stringent. So now people need to use an elevator and have a, transport chemicals in a cart? Yes, it's possible. I never, never, ever want to shut down my exhaust. Hazard facility, non-hazard facility, exhaust stays on. The logic is, if we had a hazmat incident in this room, I would have a, sp outside the exits, I'll have a break glass switch or a switch that says emergency ventilation control. That shuts down my makeup air. My exhaust continues. What happens is my room gets relatively negative. The logic is, keep my corridors clean, keep the hazmat event from, from spreading, and keep it in this room. The code was not written correctly until this last year. We changed the words because it just said, shut my ventilation down. And some cities were requiring, stupidly, shut down my exhaust. Shut down my exhaust, and I have an incident in this room, I now lost my building. You never want to shut down my exhaust, ever, 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 period. And of course, now the code's correctly written. Was, sometimes accidents do happen. This is a, a pickup truck by a professor at University of Missouri in Rollo that went to a garbage dump or a, a dump and he found a cryogenic oxygen cylinder. The professor was looking for some scrap metals. Here was a brand new doer that still had oxygen in it. He told his student, put that in the back of the truck. The student, not knowing, shut down all the valves to make sure it was tight, including the relief valve, and put the partially full oxygen doer on the back of his truck. 
as they were driving the truck, next slide, here's the trajectory of what occurred. Incident happened here, and the cylinder went over the freeway and landed there. What's the problem? What was the fire? There was no fire. Oxygen, expansion oxygen, one cubic foot of O2 liquid equals how many cubic feet of gas? 700. About, about 800, 789. So you got 800, 800 times the volume, which essentially rocket ships wherever it happens to want to go. Finds the weakest point, ruptures the vessel, and shoots off. So be careful with liquid oxygen. That, that's the point here. All compressed gases in cryogenic form. So we've got to be careful with that material. Next. Uh, foams for as far as mitigation. When do I need fire foam? And having the appropriate foam. I see more improperly specified foam. The most, most of the fire protection AFFF foams do not work on alcohol fires. They don't work. The alcohol dissolves the foam, disperses it. So I need a special AR foam. I'm telling you, you have to look at the chemistry very carefully. People put foam, yeah, put the foam in, spend my $30,000, I'm happy, but I'm doing a stupid thing, it's not gonna work. I'm not a believer in wasting money on emergency stuff that never can be used or was ineffective. This is a fire that happened at Fremont at the old Numi plant. And the answer is here, what, what, what happened here? And this is a good fire because we learned from this fire. The idiot truck driver came and filled up gasoline storage vessels. The Numi's facility was a car making facility and every car got discharged into the car five liters of fuel. And then they took that five liters and they, they had a test track there, they ran them up, loaded them on a truck and out transport them wherever they're going to go. Well, this guy was refueling that tank where they came from. And it obviously had a fire and let me show you why. The idiot truck driver decided not to put his grounding strap on there. If any of you ever flown an aircraft, you know, if you're refueling, the first thing you do is you clip a grounding strap. Ever, ever, never don't do that, period. We are lazy as far as automobiles, and we don't do that. So people aren't used to that. Well, the truck driver is supposed to know that before you fuel up, you put a grounding strap on. He did not do it, had a static discharge, and caused a truck to melt down in a massive conflagration that caught, impinged everything, including these outside storage tanks. Now, the good part of the story is, um, building official then, Masood Abahoda called me. He says, Reinhardt, Numi wants to reuse those tanks. And I said, you got to be kidding me. He said, oh, no, they want to reuse. I said, well, I'll tell you what, you get a metallurgist and a California licensed structural engineer to certify those tanks and go for it. And to my surprise, back in 92, 93, the reports came back, the tanks are suitable for the intended purpose and have no non-functional reason. This is a fire that, uh, that I did some investigation on in Menlo Park, a biotech company, and what was impressive to me was the building was totaled, nothing left, nothing worth salvaging. We opened the flammable storage cabinet, and there are some full bottles of acetonitrile, which is a 1B flammable liquid, that are un unburned, untouched. Shows me the value of a flammable storage cabinet, so use them in your shops, encourage them, and, and not keep them on top of it or put your books on it, but the 18 gauge double steel facility does a really nice job. And of course, the problem here is what, what's wrong with this picture? You can't have ignition source within 20 feet. Uh, you can't also have an emergency eye wash behind the doors you're serving. Doesn't do a lot of good. And you can't, vi you can't violate it. If you violate or drill a hole in this, you've changed the listing. There's a listed cabinet, and the listing only applies without modification. The minute you drill a hole in it, it's now got to be re-engineered. Scrubbers are no longer required in any facility in the United States if they have special valves on them. So if I have a toxic gas right now, we can have a chlorine system in this room, and I don't have any scrubber anymore? That's correct, as long as I have a valve on there. If you have this magic valve, you don't need scrubbers anymore. Thank God every Electronics company I know of does not subscribe to this code. There's a minimum standard of care, but a lot of utilities and governmental agencies are now using this. If I have this valve, which is a fail-safe to close, air to open valve, so if I have a, a release here of, of a material or monitor sees chlorine, all of a sudden this <coughs> pneumatic thing pops up a piston and shuts off the gas valve. <coughs> does it work? Mostly it does. 
However, if I have neck leakers, which are often found in toxic gases, it doesn't work. So I still need proper ventilation. But if I have that, I don't need scrubbers anymore. This is kind of like the big picture. And again, architects usually drool over this. This is how much bigger buildings can get now in the new code. So I used to be limited to an H2 occupancy. Let's say H2 in a type 2A building. I now can be two and a half times bigger than it was in the old code. Again, this shows you how we're limited in chemistry, where we can have chemistry, low floors. And once you get above the third floor, you really can't do much in the laboratories anymore. And this kind of shows you the chemistry, that how it decreases in the old, old code, current code, the L occupancy, which allows chemistry now to really goes up as high as we want to go. Almost every research facility in California, research facility, is in violation of the law on the fourth floor, unless they go to an L occupancy. And that was kind of the logic we used to get the state legislature to adopt it. And now it's law in this area and in all of California. It's written already. Uh, 2013 is put to bed. It'll be 2014 for us. If you want copies of the presentation, they're yours to have. Uh, feel free to use it, go teach it, enjoy it, play with it, and participate in the process. If there's something you find wrong in the code, bring it up to somebody. And if you have a code issue or question, send it to, to me and I will answer it and publish it and get your code questions answered. Reinhardt's Code Corner still exists. Thanks a lot, guys. Thank you.